So we will go ahead and get started. And this session is improved data with, with uh, excuse me, improved student outcomes with data. And we have three uh, presenters here and, and I am serving as your moderator. And so we have, excuse me one second. We have today, Michael Lamont from Atlanta Public Schools, Bobby Blount from Cherokee County, and Tim Fleming from Forsyth County. And the three of them have been using data in their districts for a number of years to really drive improved outcomes for students. And so each of them will have about 15 minutes to present. And then at the end, we will have an opportunity for Q&A. So Michael, I am going to unshare my screen and you can take it from here. Awesome. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna just take a second, to get my screen share started. Um, so uh, thanks everybody. Um, yes, I'm Michael Lamont. I'm the executive director of the Data and Information Group. I'm really excited to be talking to you all today about uh, Atlanta Public Schools and how we've used uh, data over the past few years to improve student outcomes. So just a little framing and context to, to get us started. So APS is one of the largest school districts in Georgia. We serve about 52,000 students across 87 schools. The way we're organized is we're organized into nine different uh, K-12 clusters that comprise of 58 traditional schools. We do have 18 charter schools in our district, um, as well as six partner schools and some citywide gender academies. Preview here on the left, you can see our uh, student enrollment over time. We've grabbed, actually this is directly out of the Godot FTE counts. This is, I think, 26 or 27 years of data that we've taken off of that website. And we've kind of scraped it and put it into a Tableau dashboard. And you can see every color represents a different uh, racial, racial ethnic group uh, in APS and how that trend has changed over time. Um, and then on the right, CCRPI, which is the College and Career Readiness Performance Index, which is a state accountability system that we use for our school systems. We've overlaid a map of each of our nine uh, clusters and the attendance boundaries and then color coded for the CCRPI there. Um, What's really interesting about APS is we are one of the most unequal cities in the entire United States when it comes to income disparity. Um, and it is rather shocking when I say this stat. The median household income in APS was $167,000 for our white students, but only $23,800 dollars for black students in APS. And that's according to census data uh, from 2010. And that in and of itself is just absolutely mind blowing when you think about what that difference means for our students every day and what we have to work against. Um, what you see, this graph is actually uh, from the New York Times blog, The Upshot. Um, and so you can see just by color, it represents the different ethnicities and left and right socioeconomic status of the parents. And you can see as students get more affluent, their achievement goes up. And in America, as we know, um, a lot of our um, socioeconomic income is aligned across race. And so when you look at APS specifically, um, you have black and white students that are four and a half grade levels apart uh, in their achievement. And so again, this helps set the context when we start talking about APS and our data. So given our unique context, what is our data strategy approach, if you will? And we have a two-pronged data strategy approach that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about APS Insights. This is our public data reporting blog. So anybody right now in the audience, if you want, you can just Google www.apsinsights.org, um, and you can see a lot of the, the charts and graphs that I'm going to show for a while. And then the second approach is internal to us. It's APS Graphs. This is our internal data system that we use. This The data in there, for protected, they're individual student-level data, um, and so those aren't available to the public, but they're available to our individual students, teachers, school administrators, district administrators, superintendent, et cetera. So I'll talk about both of our approaches today. So APS Insights, like I said, this is our public data reporting. This is primarily geared towards parents, community members. We have a couple different key aspects to this. We do a school profile section, an enrollment map, a place for some of our more data savvy community members to explore data, and then a, a public blog. So we've really used this to help build a narrative and understanding around our communities, around some of these disparities, um, to really then shine a flashlight on 
both areas we need to improve and acknowledging that it's very important to this district and this administration, uh, given our unique context, to be very open and transparent with our data. And so this is our effort to do that. So on the left, this is 2020 graduation rates. We're very upfront with the differences in socioeconomics here in APS. You can see um, each dot represents a different uh, race and ethnicity. and when they're connected, that's one school. So for example, here you can see North Atlanta High School, you can see the differences in the racial subgroups here and both, and then also for APS as a whole, the district. So you can see here, we have vast differences between our, the blue dots are represent our black students and their graduation rates compared to our white students and their graduation rates. And again, this is a flashlight to highlight. We still have a lot of work to do. And while our graduation rate has improved dramatically over the past, uh, five years, um, we still have lots and lots of work to do to promote equity amongst all of our students. The ones on the right are actually by gender. And so you can see, look at the large difference in almost every single one of our schools um, when you look at graduation rates by gender. And so again, when you think about our data strategy approach, uh, you can't improve what you don't know is a problem. And so we see the, we see and recognize that there are issues, um, you know, specifically here with our graduation rate, again, publicly available, we want people to see and know that we take this seriously um, and then put strategies against it. Here, um, what's in, an important measure for us in the schoolhouse is the Georgia Milestones Assessment. These are the tests that students take at the end of um, third through eighth grade in various subjects and some in high school. And so this is ELA proficiency. So for our third through eighth graders um, that take the ELA exam. And so again, this is publicly available. Every dot represents at an individual school different racial subgroups. And so even our highest performing schools, uh, a morning side, again, these are in some of those very, very affluent neighborhoods. You can see the stark difference in those students that are proficient and above within the same schoolhouse. So, right, you've got, you know, 30, 40, 50 percentage points difference in the percentage of students scoring proficient on those end of, uh, end of grade exams um, in the same schoolhouse. And so again, um, it's important for us to both get those data out there, but then for the public to see and be upfront about, but then also to show um, why it's so important that we continue to focus on all of our students, because while it might look like an individual school is doing really well, there are areas for growth in, in majority of our schools where we really need um, to focus on all students. This is what I'm particularly proud about that we put on APS Insights. This actually takes that a step further because a lot of the, the nuances we heard communities uh, raising were, you know, the, the white students at a certain, in a certain school were different uh, than maybe the white students at a different school. So what we did here is we developed internally a challenge index, which is a combination of a poverty measure and English language learner status. And we actually created that challenge index for each of our three largest socioeconomic or uh, racial subgroups. So we got black, Hispanic, and white. And you can see each color represents that. And then left and right represents poverty. So you can see, if you notice, where all the red dots clustered on that left hand side up. Up is higher achievement, left is more affluent. So you can see, as you would expect, very similar to that upshot and uh, Reardon article that I talked about earlier. Um, Socioeconomics and race are strongly related in Atlanta public schools, and that plays out at our schools. The highest performing are tend to be uh, not only our most affluent, but also our white. And then you can kind of see across the middle, there is a difference, but socioeconomics plays such a large part um, in the story of achievement in APS. But you do see some outliers. So you see like a Drew Elementary, which is a high performing charter, um, and how they are actually outperforming uh, what we would expect for their black students, given even both their affluence um, compared to their white peers. So this is, again, publicly available data that lets us see those highlights, those, those schools that are doing really well, um, but then also those areas where we need to improve and, again, shines a light on the inequity in our schools. So I talked about the public data approach. I can nerd out for a little bit about our, our private data, so I'll just give a brief um, highlight of APS graphs. Um, for our CS heavy people, we've got uh, a very robust AWS instance. Um, this is our architecture, you know, 
just run through what we do. We've got EC2s, redshift clusters. We do lambda for some alerts. We do a VPN tunnel, like all, all of these, all of these things um, that we manage internally in APS to serve up a Tableau server internally. Like I said, to all of those um, users, we have students that have some dashboards available that I'll show you one of. Our teachers have access to access to dashboards. I'll talk about as well as our district level administrators. Um, General Flow, we take data from a whole bunch of different disparate data sources, and we use Matillion as our ETL tool um, that takes all the data, transforms it, and moves it into a Redshift cluster. Um, and then from that Redshift cluster, we actually have a live data connection there to our Tableau server, um, again, that allows our end users to see the data visualizations that we create. Um, one example of how we're using data uh, to improve student achievements. If um, when we APS was coming back to face-to-face -face instruction here, uh, like in winter in February and March, one of the most important things we needed to know was who was willing to come back in person. We think about January, February, height the height of the pandemic. Um, we wanted to open our schools because we knew we needed to get kids back in the building, but we didn't know how many people were going to come back. So we set up a LAMP server in our AWS instance. We threw a quick survey in there with a MySQL database in the background, and we were able to have parents log in, take a survey to tell us if they were coming back in person or not. They would take the results, throw it into a MySQL database, then we would um, move that with an ETL into actually a live dashboard that refreshed every hour that would allow us to see for every single cluster that I talked about that our schools are organized into, but then also every individual school, the percent of students who indicated that they were coming back in person. Um, because as we know, uh, Atlanta has a wide variety um, and is very diverse. So we had some schools where over 80% of parents took that survey and said, yep, I'm coming back in person. And then in the same district, we had some schools where in the teens of people said that they were coming back in person. So you've got some schools that were that had to plan in real time for 80% of their kids coming back in person. So how do you do that social distancing? How do you do that um, with buses, et cetera, compared to ones where maybe one out of every five kids at best were coming back? Um, and so again, using that data help improve our students because how do you shift teachers around uh, to get the best in-person or the best virtual experience for all of those kids? Using these data were profoundly impactful for the experience of our students had when they came back or stayed virtual this year. Um, here's something we're really proud of. Uh, that last view was something student level that our district administrators could see. This is one that our teachers can see. So, you know, all, um, you know, about 3,500 of our teachers have access to this dashboard where you can actually see um, each row is a different student. And we, we assign these colors based on like internal measures in ELA, math, attendance, their actual grade performance and behavior. Um, and we do have a colorblind option. I really appreciated how, you know, we're, we're doing closed captioning here. Um, and another ability that we want to make sure we control for is colorblind. So we actually have a toggle that turns a majority of our dashboards from the more traditional red, green, uh, traffic light-esque to a colorblind palette um, for those people that need it. But again, this allows teachers to see at a quick glance, um, either for their class, for their all the students that they see, who's struggling in what areas and really target performance there. You can filter and only see like, hey, I want to see all my kids who are really struggling in ELA achievement. And that list will highlight and change for that. Or I, I really want to know who's struggling with attendance because I might really need to see and interact with them in a different way and invest them in coming in a different way. And so you can do that. So this student data profile allows all levels of our district to see a comprehensive list Again, pulling from all those different disparate data sources and really drive improvement for those students based on the needs and based on the interventions we have at those individual schools. Um, wrapping up, this is a, that all um, all of our 11th and 12th graders can log into APS Graphs and see. This is a match and fit tool that allows students. It actually pulls all their data um, from from different data sources, so their GPA out of our SIS infinite campus, um, SAT files, et cetera, to kind of allow them to build a list of colleges and universities at like different levels. So like, is it a, is it a target school that you think you're, up, you're probably gonna get into or a reach school where yes, you should apply, but you may or may not be able to get in or a likely school where you're gonna get in. And again, this allows 
college counselors, some of our college advising core people to sit alongside our students and really help them make better decisions for their post-secondary options. Um, you can see we have an estimated cost per year right there. So it's just a really powerful tool that lets our students be empowered with their data um, and sit alongside an adult to really take that next step forward um, in their progress. Um, I have a question, I will get to that at the end, um, but I'm gonna pass it along to our next presenter um, to take it from here. All right, thank you very much. This is uh, Bobby Blount. I am the Chief Information Officer for Cherokee County Schools. And um, one second, my slide will come up, there you are. So we are somewhat um, in our infancy on developing our data visualization portal. Um, this is something that my team and I've been talking about for um, quite a while now. We've seen a few of the uh, work that um, my colleagues in other districts have done just a terrific job. And uh, we've had this vision as well as being able to bring some um, some graphics and some, some dashboards to our administrators so they can um, have access to the information that I think will um, help them make some informed decisions in our schools and, and help our students achieve a little bit better as well. Um, Aspen, just to give you a little um, background on our system. Um, our student information system is Aspen. We're one of three districts in the state of Georgia that uses that particular um, student information system. The neat thing about our configuration is that our data store is on premise. So we own all of our data. We don't have to call Follett to say, hey, give us access. We have it all here. Um, everything's based in Microsoft SQL. So we can pretty much make this data do whatever we need it to do. We have direct access to all of it. Um, we have the ability to generate and um, create uh, customized um, reports for our our administrators upon request. Um, and we have a limited ability to correlate data across multiple systems, such as our transportation, school nutrition systems like that. We have um, access to a lot of those systems, but we have not yet officially built a, a formal data warehouse. That is gonna be a next major, major step. Although we have a lot of our data contained and um, you know, accessible and available to us. Um, the gaps that we identified were um, we needed to create a resource that relinquishes the dependence on other on IT to develop all of these custom reports and everything. And many of them were just common everyday things they needed to know. And so we wanted to build something that would allow the end users to um, kind of self-serve, provided we gave them access to it. Um, we wanted to make sure that the information was relevant and as close to real time as possible. Uh, we didn't want stagnant information. So the information within our portal is at least 24 hours um, um, old. Um, we needed to be easily accessible and easy to use and easy to understand. Um, last year and the year before that, we really tried to put a lot of emphasis with our administrators and our teachers on um, building up their Microsoft Excel skills so that when we finally did release this and they were able to pull data down, they would know kind of what to do with it. We found out they were a little lacking in their understanding of Excel basic features and everything. So our instructional technology team really um, put a lot of effort in helping them to understand that. And the biggest thing we wanted to do was to um, contain our costs for this system overall. So what we decided to do is use Microsoft's Power BI. Um, we have an A5 license, um, which allows us to have access to Power BI Pro for everyone in the district. So um, we already had the resources that we needed. Um, it allows all users on this tenant to access dashboards that are created uh, based on the credentials and the permissions that we give to them. We looked at a lot of um, other third-party companies to give us this ability to visualize our data and, and build these interfaces. And Power BI was um, something we already owned. And with just some time and some, some, some dedication, um, my data team was able to do this. Um, they spent about three months uh, self-teaching themselves um, the basics of Power BI. Um, you know, there's great videos out there, great resources from Microsoft. We also had the option of um, pairing with um, resellers or, or vendors or business partners to um, do some custom work and everything. But again, what we had to do, uh, we have very limited funds. So uh, my, my staff got very creative, started dabbling in it a little bit, and they were able to really produce a very nice um, interface for us that we're very proud of. Um, we um, um, 
um, put it as it was a job target that I had on my list as a chief uh, for my superintendent. And I said, you know, by the end of this academic year, we will have a, a data portal to look at. And we released it to our to our community um, right around spring break. And so um, they were able to look in there and um, there was some some important information that they needed to have access to. So this is kind of what we came up with, our data visualization for student information ser services. Um, it gives you a snapshot of our real-time enrollment at the time. Um, what was important here um, during that time that we released this was the overall grade distribution. And that was a snapshot at the spring break time of the year as to how our kids were doing. We had 42% in the solid green that were doing really, really well. 22% were in the Bs, 14% were in the Cs, and we had 17% of our students who were failing. And that was a big problem considering spring break was right there and we were going in a testing season right after that. So it was important for our administrators, our, our principals and assistant principals and curriculum directors to understand, hey guys, we got a problem. 17% of our kids are failing um, and that's a, that's a big, big problem. And so what this portal allows us to do is we can dig down into the data. This is not live, this is not real time because you know we wanna be sensitive about not sharing any personal information. But we do have the ability to go in and look at that 17% to see exactly who those kids are, and more importantly, who those teachers are who is working with those kids to make sure that they're aware. And so this basic um, screen here gives us um, some, some basic student demographics, the number of male versus females, instructional program participation um, um, of our special ed programs, especially remedial, EL, Section 504, RTI, gifted, and overall special ed students. And then we also wanted an instructional setting breakdown in person versus digital that um, Michael just mentioned a minute ago, where we also surveyed our parents and had them um, uh, um, send in commitment letters, you know, hey, I'm going to be here next year or I want to do remote learning. And this gave our administrators a snapshot of um, how many of those students. You can see we have a majority of our students who will be returning. And we think even this 1,048 that's listed here, I don't know if you can see that or not, um, will most likely, um, that number will drop significantly as well. Looking at another screen here, um, we've just got some student demographics by residency, uh, breaking down their gender, instructional setting, um, ethnicity, grade levels, and what percentage is there. We have, um, on the left side here, we have some, some drop down menus where the user can self serve. They can go in and they can decide what information I can filter this the way I want to using some of these drop down windows and everything. We've got our school and our student counts on this side. So it gives it um, straight forward. If you want to know specific information about your RTI students, um, you click that checkbox there and it'll bring that information up for you as well. So, um, that was very convenient and very handy for, for them. And we wanted to keep a lot of the screens very, very simple, very straightforward, and not, not overwhelm them with too much at once. Um, um, this is our student demographics and residency by country of birth. Um, you've got a breakdown, and you see a majority of our kids um, not born in the United States are from uh, Guatemala. And so, um, you know, um, it breaks it down to all of the different languages and everything that, that we have within our district as well. So easy to access right at their fingertips and 24 hours is the oldest. Um, did another snapshot of uh, the number of our kids uh, and which state they were born in. Some of them wanted to know, you know how many kids are from you know, places other than Georgia. So we were able to provide that information within this, um, within this um, portal as well. And that was very handy for them. Um, student demographics and residency, um, a snapshot of our homeless students. Uh, we don't serve any international exchange students at this time or whatever, but we have students um, out, of out of county students and then students on reassignment where they've decided they want to um, um, move from one school to, to another uh, because of a special program we have in our district. I didn't give you the breakdown. We serve about 42,000 students. Um, in Cherokee, um, that's in six high schools, seven middle schools, and the remainder are elementary or um, centers. Um, this upcoming academic year, we will be opening our first virtual high school, um, iGrad Academy, and so we're excited about that. So that'll put us at 40 um, schools technically there. So, um, 
And then our student instructional program, a little bit more on our special ed breakdown, uh, the number of students that we have in special education, Section 504, that we're serving through RTI, our gifted English learners and remedial students as well. And this is really handy because this is one of those reports that we would often get this request from our special ed um, department. And so now they can um, self-serve and um, we not have to um, um, jump through too many hoops for them. Um, again, breaking down, uh, we have, uh, you know, if I clicked on Bascom Elementary School, we can give me a count of you know, the, the breakdown there, gender and ethnicity there as well. So I'm very handy. Uh, we have some screens that are under construction because my data team has, um, they, the wheels have begun turning and they're really excited about doing a little bit more with it. So um, we are so we're collecting uh, feedback from our administrators. Uh, we've made this available to our administrators um, at the central office, principals, assistant principals, counselors, um, um, school psychologists, those people have access to this. Eventually, we will open this up to teachers. Um, we plan on doing a parent sort of experience with this, as well as a student experience um, on our roadmap. And so hopefully all of that will come to fruition and we'll be able to um, to um, to deliver that um, rather rather quickly. Now that we're getting more comfortable with the, with the tools and resources there, so um, this is another big snapshot of our in-person students and our digital learners. We had seven who requested, but haven't yet quite made that um, commitment yet. Um, 1,048 have confirmed that they want to come in. So this number changes dynamically depending on how um, those parents make their decisions. Um, getting close to the end here, we have um, our high school courses. This is that breakdown of our kids. Um, we were really interested in being able to provide to our administrators which of our seniors were really in in in, in trouble of not graduating, and this uh, this dashboard uh, allowed them to click down on student data at the bottom here, or course distribution, and really dig down to find out specifically in that school which students are failing, and they can target those students, have conversations with those teachers, and develop some interventions to help um, save those kids or get some, some course recovery um, going on there. So um, we can click on any of these uh, sections here to do a deep dive into social studies or science or physical education or any of these areas there. It gives us an overall um, average current grade district-wide of 82.6. Uh, we'd love to see that in the 90s, but you know um, that, that is where we are now or that is where we were then. So. Um, and what we've learned so far is um, we'd recommend you conduct discovery meetings with your stakeholders to determine what data needs to be included. You provide sneak peeks um, to core stakeholders during development to make sure you're delivering what they need. Uh, we chose a few people in curriculum and in school operations and a few of our principals to uh, have them take a look and say, are we going down the right path with delivering with what you're needing? Um, keep the data visuals as simple as possible. Um, but uh, not, you know, not so simple that it doesn't inform and, and doesn't help them. And determine who needs access to what data to make sure there are no FERPA violations are being um, made and, um, and um, make sure you monitor this throughout this year because people change positions and you wanna make sure that uh, you have the appropriate permissions for the role that you're in. And my last point there is you never really finish the project. It should be and will be fluid always, all right? So thank you very much. That's all I have. I think I even spared a minute for my for my for my buddy, Mr. Tim Fleming from Foresight. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, that was excellent, by the way. Both Michael and Bobby, y'all did a great job. I actually got a little list going over here of mm -hmm. things I want to add. Um, so uh, my team will love that starting tomorrow. We'll be adding new stuff. Um, so I want to... Um, loading the dashboard for you real quick. Uh, we've been working on the, our dashboard for about um, a year and a half. And um, I want to take you, instead of going straight in the dashboard, I want to kind of take you backwards a little bit. So I'm going to start at the end. One of the things we found out was that with COVID hitting, there was so much going on that teachers didn't have time to go to the dashboard. They had, they were trying to do virtual classes. They were trying to do their regular classes. It was just a load of stuff that they were trying to do. So we worked with um, Microsoft and a group called 3Cloud to help us um, create a chat bot. And we named our chat bot AVA, which stands for Academic Virtual uh, Assistant. 
And what Ava does is Ava goes and looks at the information that is in the dashboard and she brings it to the counselor so that they don't have to go into the dashboard themselves. So basically what we're looking at here is a email that counselors get every Friday and it's from Ava and it says, hey, here's a list of students that we feel like that Ava determines are in need. They are not going to graduate. Um, they are um, failing classes that are required classes. And we'll talk about how she comes up with this information in a minute. But um, but gives them a chance to actually see the dashboard or see the information without having to go into the dashboard, which you'll see in a minute has a lot of detail, but sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. So when they get this and they go to the section that says to view the student's data, please click the following link and they click the 360. They go into a page that looks like this. Uh, we took a screenshot of it. I've covered up the information that was pertinent to the students so that we didn't share that. But um, here you'll see it gives them a little more information. It gives them the grade level that they're in. It gives them the uh, prediction score. And we'll talk about how Ava predicts whether students graduate in a minute. Um, it looks at the GPA. And then it tells them whether they're on track, off track, and we have five different indicators. So it starts at college and career ready, and it ends at extremely off track. And then there's three in the, in the middle that kind of show um, where the students are. So you can see in the top left-hand corner, that's kind of the first screen. By clicking on that, you go into the second screen, which is the um, student graduation map. And I'm actually going to take you into a little bit more of a close-up of this. The student graduation map is really cool because it shows the counselor the exact courses the student needs to graduate. So for us in, in Forsyth County Schools, we have um, 23 credits that are required, but they're specific credits. They're credits in electives. We have credits in fine arts, uh, English language arts, math, science, social studies. And you can see that Ava basically gives them the list and says, here are the seven credits you need in electives. You have to have four in English. You have to have uh, one in health and PE, but then it also shows what those students are doing in those courses. If they're current, if they've passed them, it gives them a credits earned. You can see this student in particular in the English language arts needs four credits and they've, they've passed three of those four, but it goes further and it shows if they are actually in that class. So Ava not only looks at their transcript, but she also goes in and looks at the independent classes that they're in and then they color code it for the counselors to make it easy. So if they have a C, which is, you know, getting close, you're still passing, but you're getting close to failing, we turn it um, yellow. If they're passing with no problems, they're green. And if they're failing a course, especially a course that is required, it turns those courses red so the counselor can quickly see what's going on and if they need to address this with the student. We also have a feature, and this is uh, not live yet. And I want to say live, it's not to all of our students, but it is in, we are trying it with a small group of students and working with them. What we also wanted to do is not just give the counselor the ability to see it, but also give the student the ability to see it. So what you're looking at here is our chat bot that actually works in Microsoft Teams. So all the products, by the way, that we're going to be showing you today are all Microsoft products, the chat bot. Everything we did was built inside Microsoft. Like Bobby, we also have the A5 license, which gives us a lot of interesting, fantastic tools by Microsoft. We added some to those, including the chat bot. But you can see here, the student can actually go into Teams and start a, a conversation with Ava. And Ava allows them to, number one, um, they can look at that academic status. That's the page I showed you at the beginning that the counselors can actually see. The student can see the same page about themselves. So they have to log in to get it so that we can make sure they have the correct role. But then number two, they can actually click and start a conversation and schedule um, with the counselor. So Ava can help the, the student schedule a time to meet with the counselor. And this allows the student to A, look at their information. And if they're having an issue with graduation or they're scared they're not going to graduate, then they can simply um, have Ava help schedule a meeting for them with their counselor so they can begin to talk to the counselor and find out what they need to do uh, to get back on track. So I've showed you the counselor, kind of what they get on a Friday from an email. I've showed you the student, how they can kind of look at that information. And now I want to take you into the dashboard. So this is kind of where Ava gets all of her information from. And the first screen I'm going to show you is our graduation prediction model. So this was interesting. This took a, 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 about two months to, to get pulled together. But what happens with this information 
is that um, we pulled 10 years of data um, of our past students. So we looked at 10 years of data from our students, and we looked at the students who graduated and the students who did not graduate. And from that, we begin to pull together um, machine learning begin to pull together what was things that helped students graduate and what things hindered them or hurt them um, when they and 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 helped them not to graduate. And you can imagine some of the ones on the list were like GPA. Um, if you have a low GPA, that hinders you from graduation. So the machine learning was able to look through our ten years worth of data and come up with the the things that it found was important for students um, passing or failing courses and in turn graduating from uh, Forsyth County Schools. And you can see in the prediction explanation section of it, you can see that um, it actually gives you a list of what the computer found for each list of groups of students and it shows them red saying that hurt them and um, the blue shows that that helps them. So the bottom one is GPA. You might not can see that on your screen, but the bottom one's GPA that helped them in this group of students. And that's why it was blue. Their tardy, unexcused absences hindered them in their graduation prediction score. And you'll see that's why it had it in red. But what was interesting is there's things in there that we would have never thought of. You know, we would have picked things like GPA right off the top. Um, tardies would be an easy one. Even discipline would have been an easy one. But what we found from the machine learning is it came up with things like field trip. Students who took more field trips uh, had a better chance of graduating than students who did not. Now, I know probably you're thinking right now, well, wait a minute, explain that. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain why that happens. I have theories that we talked about and we believe are probably true, but I can't explain why the machine learning came up with, with the field trips versus, um, you know, something else that it would have come up with. So, um, and we can talk more about that definitely if you'd like to at some point in time in 15 minutes, I won't have be able to go into a lot of detail, but we actually work with a data scientist to help us kind of dig into this a little bit and give us some information that would help us. But what we ended up finding out was it was able to put the students into basically into groups to help us identify students who needed help. And it ranked them on a scale of one to five, high confidence being five and low confidence being one. And we were able to now make that available for counselors to be able to see who needed their help, who was the students who needed someone to come in and work with them and get them on track for graduation. But it also does more than that. Ava also not only looks at the 10 years worth of data, but it also goes into the dashboard and it looks at, are they taking the required courses? And then are they passing the required courses? So basically you're getting two pieces of information when you look at the prediction score. You're looking at what it found out from the machine learning. And then it's you're also getting, well, after it looks at that information, it then looks at, are they taking the required courses and are they passing them? If they're failing a course, obviously they go down on the scale. If they're passing all their courses or have passed all their courses they need for graduation, they get moved up to moderate to high confidence level. So I want to just kind of give you a little bit more information about the dashboard because I think that's important as we kind of look overall at, at, at what's going on. And the whole dashboard, everything you're seeing from here on out is in Power BI. Um, so we created all the dashboards in Power BI. When we, when we put the dashboard together, we tried to find things that, that really made a difference for people. And we started off with the screen you see here, which is a real basic screen. And it just gave us information like how many students do we have and, and what's the, uh, what is their ethnicity? What is gender? What is ESOL, gifted, 504? What are the things that we wanted to see so we could kind of understand where our student data was? But from there, we really started digging in a little deeper. And these two pages in, in particular are, are important because one shows our academic side of the house, and that's the top right-hand side that you're looking at. And that's showing not only the same information, the gender, ethnicity, ESOL, gifted, things like that. It also shows that graduation prediction level. You see that in green, the 411. Um, but it also shows the information that's academically relevant, like what did they score on their EOG? or what they score, which is end of grade, or their in, or EOC, which is their end of course classes. And then what are their current classes, which is the far right-hand side? What are their grades in their current classes? So um, counselors can see this, but also we make this available to teachers. 
So teachers can see their students and only their students. Counselors can see only the students assigned to their schools. And then principals can see the entire school. And then district staff can see, look at the entire district. Um, but then we, we gave them things like the number of days absent. And we broke that down into excused and unexcused. But also GPA. In the, le- in the bottom one, you can see the behavior report. This was important because we wanted to see what was going be- on behavior-wise. And what we really saw about this was it enabled us to look at groups of students and ensure that discipline was even across different groups. So from here, you can sort students by um, gender. You can look at male versus female and found out what offenses they committed, but also what um, – what did they get? What incident resolutions did they get? Were there in school suspension, out of school suspension, parent conference, things like that? So this really gave us a chance to take a look at how we were doing discipline and how we were doing it versus for each group. How did it work for um, students with looking at gender, ethnicity, but also our gifted versus our non-gifted or our 504 versus non-504? Um, so it enabled us to basically look at where we were and and help form um some trends for what we need to do better at and what we were really doing a good job at. And we were able to work with principals to see that data so that they can um, make a a, um, informed decision about how their school is handling discipline. So I know my time is short, so I want to kind of get to the last couple real quick. This was a page that we really thought was important. um, And that is that we came up with students in need. And what we what we found out from our counselors, they said, we need to know the students who have the lowest GPA, the lowest grade, the most behavior, and the most absences. And we kind of need to know those students in some way together. So we came up with a document that where we were able to go pull that data. We could pull the students with the lowest grades, the lowest GPA, the most behavior, and the most absences, and then they're able to go work with their students. And what I love about the Microsoft Power BI product is on this document, you can actually right-click any student's name if you've worked with them and have and have you know helped them fix their absence problem, let's say. You can exclude them, and it brings up the next students in line. So it becomes a working document that works for each counselor or each teacher that they can work with their students, address the issue, exclude. Once they get it addressed, it pulls up the next group, and they can continue to exclude. That only affects their point of view. It doesn't affect anyone else who's looking at the dashboard. It only it only works for you and your login. So that was really important um, for us is how do we get information that's that's actionable? How do we make it where you can, as a counselor, and you've got 20 minutes of spare time. I know counselors don't have 20 minutes of spare time. I'm just making this up. But they have a few minutes of spare time, and they want to work with a few students. Where do they go to find those students? And this is the page we created for that. And what's interesting is a lot of this page and how we created it came from a, a one of our really good counselors, and he had a stack of people that he had on his desk, and he had them in different stacks. And he said, this is my students who have behaviors. I need to work with them. This is my students who have GPA issues. you got to work with them. And he kind of created these stacks that were on his desk, and we took that idea and just created it in one dashboard so that he didn't have to have stacks of, of paper on his desk. And everyone else could have that same great work that he was doing could be shared by others. So I think my time is up and, um, and I think I'm right on time, but, um, that's basically, um, an overview into our dashboard and the work that we're doing at Forsyth County schools. Um, it is, by the way, if I didn't say this before, it's my pleasure to be able to present with people like Bobby and Michael and Nicholas. So I'm honored to do that. And thank you for, um, allowing us to have the time. Thank you, Tim. And huge thank you to the three of you. It's been a pleasure uh, being able to moderate this panel in so much as I've actually had to do any kind of moderating. Uh, so I, like everybody else uh, who, who added some comments over there, I uh, even as someone who does work in Power BI and I've played around with Tableau before, was very impressed with the dashboards and uh, with everything the three of you have done, really. Um, and I have three questions there. And just because of the, the back and forth, we don't all want to talk at the same time. Uh, I'm going to have each of you answer uh, the three questions that I threw out there or any additional things that you would like to put out as well. 
so in turn, Michael and then Bobby and then Tim, take a look at those three. And again, uh, don't feel like you have to answer those if you'd like to use your time. Uh, but each of you has a little under, or let's say a little over four minutes. Uh, so use that time however you'd like to. Michael? Cool. Yeah. Um, I'll answer Brian, who snuck one in right ahead of you, Nicholas, and then I'll um, transition. So um, let me get back to my slide um, so that we can use the great closed caption feature. Okay. Um, and I'll get back to this in a second. I want to read it out loud so I have it. Um, how do your admins react to the availability of this data? Counselors, are they excited and immediately begin using it? Or are they hesitant uh, and finding data daunting? Um, so I think for me and our users, I think it's very similar to many technology users. You kind of have, you can kind of segment your users into different populations. And so, you know, we'll publish a dashboard, um, kind of send an email out to the, the targeted end users. And we have a segment where they're just like off and running and like using it, we can see their usage patterns and they're just like in it and clicking all over the place and getting data. Um, and it's great. And then we have kind of some middle of the road users who will use it kind of like in association with whatever the, the dashboard purpose is. And then we have some hesitant users that maybe we don't, we don't see them log in or maybe we can see they kind of got stuck and stopped. And so kind of depending on the user profile, we might target different, um, different things around them. So uh, we will, we do do trainings and then we might target the email list towards those. They won't know this, right? Like we'll, BCC everybody, but to those people that might not have logged in and kind of do a little nudge like, hey, we'd love for you to, you know, use the student data profile. We just added these features, um, things like that to kind of help them. Um, but it does range the spectrum. We do have, uh, I, you know, we've been doing these teachers have had access to dashboards like this for, you know, going on four years now. So at this point, a lot of people have experience with the dashboards. We work really hard on our UI and UX to make it user friendly for them and try and, you know, we, we heard the tension with everybody, Tim and Bobby, right? It's that tension of wanting it to be clean, not overwhelm people. And then at the same time, you have some people that really want more answers. Um, so we really want to, to make sure that we're providing support for those people. So that, that's a quick answer to that one. And then for Nick, Nick said that our challenge is using data for data-informed decision-making or culture and capacity. Um, what are your biggest challenges? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. Culture and capacity, capacity specifically around investing people in taking the time out of their busy schedule. Um, you know, we, we talk on our team, we have a joke, right? We want principals to be great principals, not data analysts or data scientists, et cetera. Like that's my team's job. We want them to be great principals. Like I do not envy the hard, hard work principals and school leaders and teachers have. Um, they have so much on their plate. And so investing them in these dashboards that we that we create in theory should, should make their jobs faster, easier, better if they use them effectively. No more spending time trying to go to different systems to pull data to make targeted groups of students. Um, but it is that combination of investing people in that and then building their capacity to use it quickly and effectively and meet their needs. Uh, because if they don't see that, um, if they don't see how using um, you know the, the student grades dashboard will help them, or we have some around transcript audits where for counselors, where we've saved um, hundreds of hours for each individual counselor by automating the transcript audit process at the end of the year. Once we invested the counselors in like, look, you can do your job, uh, you know, 10x faster with this tool, then, then we start seeing the usage and adoption. But it, it really takes a concerted effort to understand the user, understand what benefits they're going to get. Because data for data's sake, it might work for a small group of, of us, like data nerds, but for those people that have other jobs, it's really important for to get in their shoes and say, using this will help you do X, Y, and Z faster and better and, and more efficiently and, and do it that way. So I would say that. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Tim, would you like to jump in there and uh, answer any of the three that I threw out or any of your own? Sure. Let me share my screen so we can get closed captioning working. All right. I think we should be on there now. 
Um, yeah. So uh, let me kind of give you a couple. Um, one of them was um, when we first started the dashboard, it was funny. So I, I went into a group of principals and I said, tell me exactly what you want on a dashboard. And it's a, it was a whiteboard behind me. And I said, I, I, you know, just tell me what you want. Go. And I turned around ready to write and no one said anything. And a few minutes went by and still no one said anything. And I turned around. I was like, guys, what do you want on the dashboard? Like, you can pick anything. Just tell me what you want on the dashboard and I'll, I'll put it up here. And they kind of looked at each other and a little time went by and they were like, well, whatever you want to put up there, I guess. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> what happened? I mean, I thought I was going to get this great, like, you know, all these cool things they're going to tell me about. And so I left the meeting kind of depressed and I went back to my team and I started talking and I was like, okay, we're just going to put together something that we think works and then I'm going to take it back to them and see what they think. So we got together and we kind of pulled together some things and we put a picture of the kid up at the top and we put um, the student's name and we put their number and then we put some grades and we did a couple of things and I took it back to them and I said, second meeting and I said, okay, here's this. What do you think? And man, they had a thousand things. Oh, this needs to say that. And you need to have the dis their discipline on there and you need to have this and, and, and turn that and turn that green. That shouldn't be blue. They had a thousand things. And here's what I learned by that. You got to frame what you want them to know. When technology is involved, a lot of times people don't understand what you can do. So they don't want to throw out something that sounds stupid or that, you know, you couldn't do or, or that wouldn't make any sense. Or so when you deal with data, especially data, because it's, it's, it's something that everyone uses, but they can't really talk about it a lot. There's no way to kind of look at it in, in, in a way that, that makes sense that they can discuss it until you create a dashboard. Then they have a way to look at it and discuss it and talk about it. So what my advice I would give districts who or anybody else who's looking at this is start off by framing what you want to talk about. you got to put it in chunks. Frame it, give it to them, then have a discussion about it, and you'll go a lot further like that. And then the second thing I want to bring up, and I'm going to make sure I give Bobby time, is that um, when we when we started working with this, one of the things I found out is that people were too busy to have a dashboard. It, it just was so much that they, and it was something where it had to go, and it became really hard for our, our, our teachers and our counselors, especially during a COVID year, to do it. So for us, what was important is we had to bring the dashboard to them. We couldn't tell them the dashboard was there. We didn't have a lot of input. If you want to know the truth, they were just like, that's great. I'm sure you got a good dashboard. I'm just trying to keep my head above water. I don't want to look at anything else. And so it was important. We found a way to bring it to them. So one of the things that advice I would give to anybody starting this is talk to the people you're starting, you're, you're working at, find out exactly what they, they want, but find out what would make their job easier. What gives them back 10 minutes? Maybe it's that if you could just tell me all the kids in my class and if they're passing or failing, if you could do that, I'll get 20 minutes back a day. Help them get that 20 minutes back because then you can use that 20 minutes to show them how to use something that would help them long term. Hope that makes sense. And uh, I'll turn it over to Bobby. Thank you guys. Sorry, I was in transition there as well. Um, biggest challenges, um, discovery, you know, as my colleague said there, of kind of what data is of value. You know, when you're building, when you're the technology department and you're building a data portal for educators here, you know, and um, you need to make sure you truly partner with um, other educators to truly understand what is going to be of value. Uh, what sort of data are we going to present that's going to have impact on improvement? And so, um, you know, that was important for us to um, when they started building it, we knew we can get the basic information over over there. But I really want to know kind of long term, you know, administrators think outside of the box. Do you need the core? Do we need to correlate transportation and school nutrition and field trip information into the system to figure out, you know, what how those how those other entities can impact the data that's being presented to you? Um, another, you know, big challenge are just resources, just finding time. Um, um, my executive director and one of his systems analysts are the ones who worked on this and built it. 
and their first iteration of Frankenstein was very different from the end product that we see, which we call not even version 1.0, we call it version 0.5, okay, because they have some more ideas of what they want to do. Um, so um, just finding resources and time and and looking for, um, you know, data specialists and everything, data scientists to, to help you get there and everything. And Tim <laughs> brought up a good point. Remember the dashboard, you know, we built dashboards on other areas for them um, during COVID, especially to say, hey, here's some real-time information on who's coming to school, who's not. And every day we'd get a phone call from one administrator saying, hey, can you tell me how many kids I'm having today? It's like, go to the dashboard we built you. So just reminding them those resources are there. Um, I'll know that our work is successful when the principals and assistant principals start coming to us and saying, hey, can you add this in here? Because that tells me that they're they're using it, they're looking at it, you know, and, and, they're, and the wheels are turning. And so they want additional features and everything. I see us having to strengthen our policies on who has access to what data to make sure we don't violate any FERPA laws or anything like that. Uh, making sure that we keep track of who's changing positions and having access there. So we're gonna have to really, really remind people of that. Um, the days of the data wall in a room that stays locked, you know, hopefully that's all going away. I still saw that in one of the schools that I went out to this summer. And I'm like, yeah, hopefully we'll get rid of that practice there. So, and I'm hoping as we are able to build this more and make it available to our, to our students and teachers, um, we want our students invested in their learning, not just engaged, but we want them completely invested in, in how they're doing. And I think they will get, you know, there's there's a better chance of them achieving that level if they really can see the big picture of how they're doing overall. Um, and the advice I would give to a school district, anybody who's interested in doing this, is start doing your homework, participating in things like this. Um, you know, uh, you know. I told Tim when when we first started talking about this, I said we're not quite ready, quite yet ready there, but we we're we're getting, we're in our infancy. We're taking it slow. We're we're looking at what Michael's doing, what Tim's doing, what other people are doing, and um, trying to you know, um, yeah, you know, very nicely uh, borrow <laughs> some of their great ideas and everything. So I also have a list, Tim and Mike. So I'm gonna yeah put some things in mind as well. So this sort of networking is really, really a great way to start building capacity for this and and um, getting your district where you where you want them to be. So Nick, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, and, and thank you again to the three of you. Um, I just want to uh, give you one final huge thank you uh, for and and great job for everything you presented um, and. Sorry, I'm trying to adjust myself. There we go. Okay. Um, and, and I just uh, want to encourage everyone who's uh, listened today or anyone who might be watching the video, uh, watching, watching the recording later on to uh, reach out to us. It turns out it's very easy to track all of us down uh, in our emails and our contact if you just do a Google search of our names and the systems we work for. Uh, and so, again, you know, as, as you begin down that journey, for those of you who do or for those of you who have already begun it and and just see a lot of opportunity uh, for growth and, and, and based on the feedback or based on what you've seen, based on the, the work of these three districts, just be sure to reach out to one or, or two or three or four of us uh, and just let us know what you're doing. And, um, you know, we, we kind of talked early on about, uh, as we were planning for this session, about the importance of sharing those best practices and really thinking through how you can learn from each other. And so, Bobby, it's it, it, no matter how much you take, it's always borrowing, right? Like that's kind of the educator's mantra. There, there's no such thing as stealing in the world of education, right? Uh, it, it really is flattery is the best form. Uh, or, or what is it? Uh, 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 copying is the best form of flattery, right? Um, and, and we are at time, so we will go ahead and end. Um, we'll stick around in case anyone does have any last minute questions, um, but we will uh, go ahead and sign out uh, officially. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Nicholas, thank you for uh, mm -hmm. moderating and the work you did with that. Really appreciate it. You, uh, as always, well-spoken and do a great job. No, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I, I had the easy part.
and and I think we figured out a hack here all the way at the end that never worked before, and that is Tim is talking and it's actually being captured in the PowerPoint. So go oh, really. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must it must be because Tim has the uh, the special studio there. Uh, exactly. One last thought for the three of you. Uh, if you will shoot me your final versions of the PowerPoint, I will compile all of this, uh, all of yours with mine, and make sure that the Constellation team has all that information. Awesome. We'll get that done. Hey, Great. I'm about to ask you guys, do you all have the links to your slides? Um, yeah, I think we're. I think Nicholas is going to provide it. We're going to give uh, everyone um, yeah. put it on one document so they don't have to look at three different ones. Yeah, Terry, they'll, they'll send those to me today or tomorrow. I'll pull it all together in order, and I'll uh, – should I email that to you or – That'll be question? great. Let me put my email down because what we're doing is we're putting everything in the doc as well for all the sessions, so that'll be perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. Terry, thank you for your help, by the way. We appreciate yes, you being you. a part of it. Oh, you yeah, guys, you're awesome. Thank you so much. I would much. not need it. You guys killed it. I was <laughs> not <laughs> We appreciate it big time. Thank you, guys. Yeah, definitely. That's my email, so just shoot that to me when you get a chance, Nicholas. Okay. Sounds good. I'll get that to you soon. All okay. right. Thank you, everyone. Bobby, Tim, Michael, look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully at an in-person conference. Terry, <laughs> thank you again. I'm sure our, our uh, paths will cross again. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Take care, guys. Right. Take care, okay. you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.